Bibles with me, if you would, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 this morning. Let's pause for a second to pray before we get too far in. God in heaven, thank you so much again for letting us be here at your house. Pray, God, as we go into this time of your message for us, Father, God, we speak it according to your will. Speak into our hearts as you see fit, Lord. Tell us what you want us to know in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, uh, there's a comedian that I like to listen to. His name's uh, Michael Jr., funny Christian guy. Uh, he does a joke, though, that, and it is funny. He, uh, he talks about people who are oversaved and uh what he's talking about is those those people that that are uh they're they're so focused on on their relationship that they, they've gone into the the weird realm where you can't hardly even talk to them and, and you probably are and have in mind somebody that's, that's like that you know, as a matter of fact, his joke is that if you can't think of anybody, they're probably thinking of you. you know? <laughs> but, and I've laughed at that. I've heard it several times, and I've laughed at it. You know, and, uh, but here lately, I've been thinking, you know, they're on to something. And I'm beginning to get convicted that a lot of us are, are lacking in our relationship, in our commitment, in our, in our outward showing of our faith. And the more I look at those people who are oversaved, the more I'm starting to think, no, I should look a, more, a little more like them. Now, I think it's good that we, that we uh, have an ability to relate to people on a level, you know, and, and there's going so far that, that, that you can't relate. You, you know what I mean. But we need to make sure that we're always striving to get closer to God. And for that to show to the world around us in a better and more relevant, or relevant, relevant way. Amen. All right. Um, so last Wednesday night, I, I we've been teaching on the, uh, the, the the doctrines of the church on Wednesday night. And, and uh, I'll give a shameless plug for Wednesday night. If you, if you don't come to church on Wednesday night, please try to make have a good time. Right? And we're talking about here lately uh, why we believe what the Bible says about what we believe, you know, and, and, and trying to keep it uh, light and have a good time with it. But we're talking about the uh, the doctrine of God. What does the Bible say about God um, Wednesday night? And as I was going through that, I was talking about the power of God. Talking about how God is, is all powerful. Nothing is outside of his control, his realm of ability, and this awesome power that he has. And, and part of what I made a point was that we have access to the power of God. Like when we said while ago where the Holy Spirit is inside of us. Literally, I, I, I love this, the song that, uh, that expresses this, the same power that God has, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. We have access to that power. You know, and, and so on Wednesday night, we're talking about primarily the uh, the Father. We're talking about the Father, God the Father. You know, here on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about the Son, Jesus, right? Trying to preach Jesus from, from Christmas all the way to Easter. And I know it's getting close, and, and I really need to be getting into chronologically there where we need to be. But I just felt like the Holy Spirit led me to come back to this. Based on, as we were talking Wednesday night, you know, and... Uh, you know, this week, by the way, we'll be talking about the Trinity. If you're interested in knowing about that. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The power is literally inside us if we are in Christ. Okay? Now, the big point that I made was that we have access to that power because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It says things like, whatever you ask for inside God's will, you have. Whatever you ask for, you get. And look, our efforts as Christians should be fruitful, right? We should be productive. Our prayers should be changing things in our world. 
The devil, our adversary, instead of wreaking havoc in our life, should be he should be standing back and looking for a weak spot in our armor, but not finding any. But the question for that is, how much of that power do we really use? We have access to it, but how much do we use? Now you may be here this morning, you may you may be able to say, I use all of it. I've got I'm, I'm I'm fully involved and I'm using all the power of God in my life. And if that's true, that's great. Congratulations, good on you. But for most of us, we could do better. We could sometimes do a lot better. Probably each person is on a different level with that. You know, because we're different. But I'm here to tell you this morning, I'm ready to do better. I'm ready to step it up. See, that got me thinking, so, and I even said so Wednesday night as we were going through that, that lesson, you know, I said, i got to make a sermon about how to gain access to the power of God that is in us. So it's been on my mind, you know, and I'm going through the, the time I'm waiting for God to show me something, you know, because I already felt like he was leading me in that direction. Then and I, I'm looking, I'm giving y'all a little window into, into how the Lord speaks to me about what I'm going to speak to you about. Uh, Thursday, I'm, I'm out in the yard out here. I'm picking up sticks. I'm getting ready to mow the grass. I didn't. I mowed some of the grass, by the way. I didn't mow all of it. I, I like the little flowers out in the field. I know. I know they're weeds, but you know, they're they're pretty. And I don't want to mow them down yet. All right. But I'm fixing to. And I was getting ready, so I'm going around the yard. I got my wheelbarrow. I'm picking up sticks all over because all those pecan ones that fell off. You know, they're all over the place. I actually meant to get one and bring it in here with me for an object lesson this morning, but I picked them all up. Uh, but so, so I'm out there picking up sticks, and, and it was the weirdest thing. I felt like God spoke to me through those sticks that I was picking up. Let me explain. See, I, I'm looking at these sticks, and I'm actually thinking, stupid trees, how do you expect to make pecans? And all your limbs are down here on the ground. I picked up two or three wheelbarrows full of these limbs. You know, if you drop all your limbs, how are you going to make the pecans that you're supposed to be making? You know, and then I'm thinking, and yeah, I, Weird thoughts of John. I'm thinking maybe it's the limb's fault. You're down there on the ground. I, you'd still be alive if you'd have just stayed on the tree. You can't make any pecans down here. You see, you know how it works, don't you? Know how, how trees go. The, the, the tree has sap in the trunk. Especially in the wintertime, it goes down low. And in the spring, that, that sap starts coming back up. It's like the blood in your bodies. You see, in order for the limb to operate correctly, the way that it's supposed to, there has to be a free flow of that <coughs> sap going out into the limb. And if anything impedes that flow, such as in this case, falling off of the tree, the limb cannot operate on its own. It doesn't operate separate from the tree. That reminded me of an illustration that Jesus made in the Bible. Here in John chapter 15, uh, let's look at this and read verses 1 through 6, okay? John chapter 15, 1 through 6, and the words of Jesus here says, He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit is taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. <coughs> For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and then gather them and cast them under the fire, and they are burned. All right, now I need to clean something up here for just a second out of this, out of these verses of Scripture because it can be a little confusing uh, if you don't think it through. See, it sounds like, it sounds like it's speaking of losing salvation there, doesn't it? That part about getting cut off and cast into the fire and all that. All right, it sounds like that. That cannot be the case. We know that because that would contradict clear teaching on security from other parts of the Bible. So, so what's going on here? All right, here's a way that I can... I can think about it. I can process it in my mind that helps me get a grasp on what's going on. Maybe, maybe this will help you. Imagine, imagine the vineyard, right? Imagine the vineyard, the husbandman, the, the gardener. He owns the vine, right? The vine is his. Now, he can bring in a limb from somewhere else that he has acquired 
So now he's gotten a limb, he brings it in, and then he can, he, when he does that, he owns the vine, and he owns the limb that he's bringing in. All right? Then he takes that limb and grafts it into the vine, and it becomes part of it. All right? Now, the gardener, the husband, he does everything necessary for that limb to be able to grow. All right? Because he wants it to grow. He wants it to produce fruit. He takes, and if it does, if it does catch on and it starts making fruit, then he takes even better care of it and he prunes it so that it can make even more fruit. All right? But he can't make it grow, can he? And if it doesn't, what's he do? He cuts it off of there. All right? Now, at this point, who owns the limb? The husband and the gardener, even though he cut it off the vine, he still owns that limb. It's still his limb. What does the husbandman do with useless limbs? Well, you know, in my case, when I was picking up the limbs out here, I threw them all in the dumpster. But if I was at my old place where I used to live, I would have piled them all up in a big pile and burned them. Because that's just what you do with cut off limbs. All right? Now let's make this spiritual for a second. God the Father is the husbandman. Right? Scripture's clear about that. When he acquires us, the limbs, which he purchased, by the way, by the, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He bought and paid for it. We belong to him spiritually and physically. Every part of us belongs to the Father. All right? And then he attaches us. He attaches our life spiritually to the vine, Jesus Christ. In that here, here in this life, in this world, we are supposed to produce fruit. So it's about our physical life. That is attached, right? That is, we are to be an asset to the kingdom of God. We are to be productive in the kingdom of God. We are to grow. If we fail to do that, he cuts us off. Not spiritually, physically. Did you know that being an unproductive Christian can cost you your life? That's what scripture is getting at here. An unproductive branch on a vine, to go back to my example for a minute, an unproductive branch on a vine uh, can, can do harm to the production of the rest of the branches. You see, that unproductive branch is still sucking up sap and nutrients and stuff and weighing the vine down. And so it's doing damage to the production of the rest of the vine and the rest of the branches so the husbandman gets it off of there. If he's a good husbandman, he will not leave it on the vine. He will get it off because it's doing damage. But if God cuts you off physically, he still owns you. He still owns you. You see, the fire in Jesus' illustration is not the fire of hell. That's just what they did with cut off branches. It's a physical illustration. But, but who wants to be an unproductive branch that gets cut off? You know, show of hands. Who wants to? You know, that's silly. Nobody wants to be. I don't believe anybody ever gets saved but says, oh, I'm not doing anything, though. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm just, I'm just going to sit here and not, not do anything. I'm just going to be here. As a matter of fact, I'm going, to, I'm going to just look like the lost world around me, but I'm going to be saved. See, that's not the way it works. We start off motivated. We start off, we want to get out. We want to be productive. We want to grow. And we should be because look what all God has done for us. He gave his son to make that opportunity so that we could be there. And he pours blessings out for us. But like I said, all that to say this. If the husbandman, God, has done everything necessary for the branch, us, to grow, and we don't, it's our fault, not his. He did everything for us to get there. All right? Now look at this. The, the new limb, the new limb doesn't do anything to make the sap. Does it? it just takes it in or it doesn't take it in. It can't make it all. So if we make this a spiritual application, God has provided all the power that we need to prosper. We just need to learn how to use it and make sure we don't do anything to impede the flow. Because look, if it's all there and, and we don't have it, then that means somehow we're doing something to block God's power in our life. That's something to think about. 
See, there's something we need to do to unlock the power of God. I just want to show you this morning. Think of it this way. Think, think of those branches. If you go back, you go out and you look at one of these trees out here, all right? Where's the branch the biggest and the strongest at? Right where it attaches to the trunk. You ever notice that? Now, that's, that's like that, so it'll be strong and it won't fall off. But it happens because that part of the branch is the closest to where the nutrients are coming out of that trunk into the branch. And so that part grows strong and it grows hard. All right, so there's a principle I'm getting to here. The branch is the strongest where it's the closest to its source of life. If we want to experience the power of God, then we got to get close. We got to get close. See, we're, we're living sometimes. We're saved, but we're holding back. We got to get close. I want to show you three examples from Scripture, real quick, of people who experience the power of Christ. Now, what they have in common is they all had faith, they all saw a miracle when they got close to Jesus. And they all had something that was trying to keep them away. First one. Let's turn back with me. Uh, if you got a bookmark, put it there in John 15. We'll be back there in a few minutes. But go to Mark chapter 2 with me real quick. Mark chapter 2. Go look at verses 1 through 3. I'm going to have a whole lot of scriptures to flip to this morning. So I decided not to put them on the screen. Mark chapter 2, 1 through 3. We're going to go ahead and read it. It says, uh, And again he entered into Capernaum, talking about Jesus, after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway there were many gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So this guy was sick of the palsy. He wasn't walking. He couldn't walk. He's, he's He's got four friends carrying him on his, on his map there. Here we find a man who needs the power of Jesus. And it, it looks like he knew where to get it. He knew, you know, you know they had um, had trouble getting to him. Look at verse 4, what they had to go through. You know the story. Verse 4. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, there was too many people. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where on the sick of the palsy lay. Now, it's a bit of an understatement here to say that getting close to Jesus was inconvenient, right? It was inconvenient. He knew they needed to get there. But we live for convenience, don't we? Think about that for a minute. Nothing will disrupt our convenient life like getting close to Jesus. What's convenient? What's convenient is watching TV in it, right? What's convenient is, is just staying home. What's convenient is keeping to ourselves. What's convenient is, is not talking about things that might offend somebody. No, getting close to Christ is not convenient. It takes effort, but it's crucial if we want to see his power. Amen. See, thankfully, this guy had four determined friends that brought him close to Jesus, all right? Now, we see that uh, he, had, he had faith. It says in verse 5 that he had faith in himself. And it's, a, it's an important point, though. What, what are your friends like? Are they the kind that compel you closer to God, all right? See, because the next example that we're going to look at is, is a guy who found himself surrounded by the, the wrong kind of friends. Flip over a couple of uh, chapters there. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Mark 10, 46. We'll just start with 46 and 47. The Bible says here, Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went... Out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of, uh, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
So Jesus is passing through, right? Bartimaeus needs his power. And he calls out to him. But then look what happens in verse 48. It says that many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The people around him tried to keep him from getting close to Jesus. Now, I don't know if these folks uh, that, that were around Bartimaeus, if, if he thought these were his friends, but they weren't acting like friends at all, were they? They weren't doing what was right for him. Why would they do this? Why would they try to stop Bartimaeus from, from getting the attention of Jesus? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. You know, we talked about that a few minutes in Sunday school this morning. I think a lot of times the, the Bible leaves uh, gaps there so that we can so that we can apply that to a lot of different things. Right? We, we wonder why these people were doing this. You know, I don't know. I've got a couple of ideas here. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they didn't believe at all. But Bartimaeus did. You see, it says he had faith in verse 52. All right. Can you almost hear him saying, it's not real, Bart. Jesus can't heal you. Shut up about it. I'm tired of hearing about this Jesus all the time. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Give us a break, Bart. Maybe they didn't believe. And he did. Maybe because of his condition, Bartimaeus didn't have any choice but be around this group. You know, sometimes we have to be around unbelievers, don't we? Sometimes it's our workplace. Sometimes it's just... You know, where life has put us, sometimes we have to be there. And they may or may not want to hear about our Jesus at all. If this was the case, then Bartimaeus was a good example, wasn't he? Because he called out even louder. He called out all the more. And Jesus came close and Bartimaeus experienced his power. He got his sight back. You know, but maybe that wasn't it at all. Who knows? Maybe they were, maybe they were friends who would have preferred for Bartimaeus to stay blind. You say, oh, that's, that's silly. Why would somebody do that? What kind of friend is that? Well, that's not a good one. Well, let me tell you where I'm getting at with this. If you start trying to get close to God, you start making an effort to, to be more godly in your life, if you start making those efforts, there may be some who would rather you didn't. Because they don't want to, and if you start getting power and they don't, well, nobody wants to look bad. It's sad to say, but there's people like that. I don't know what was going on. What was going through the heads of the, the many who were around Bartimaeus? The point is, the people around you will either drag you closer to God, or they will hold you back. Choose wisely. Let me show you one more. Go back a couple of chapters there in Mark. We're staying in Mark. Mark chapter 5, verse 24. Mark 5, starting in verse 24. Remember we talked about this a couple of weeks ago where, uh, where Jesus is, uh, the Jairus from the synagogue come to God and says his daughter's about to die and they're in a big crowd and they're headed to Jairus' house. And then look what happens in Mark chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus went with them and much people followed him and thronged them. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, touched his garment. She got close. Now what we have to understand here, we have to understand something about Jewish law to understand the risk that she took in doing this. You see, uh, in this society, according to the laws that, that actually God had given them, all right, Actively bleeding made you unclean, right? And you just, particularly this a woman's cycle of bleeding, which she had been going through for 12 years. Now, if you were unclean, by whatever means made you unclean, you didn't go to people, you didn't touch other people, you stayed, you kept your distance. When you were unclean and there was a crowd around, you were required by law to stop them and say, unclean, unclean so that they would know to not come clean, because if you touched them, then they would be unclean too. All right, so she took a big risk in this to go purposely into a crowd, especially with the intent to go touch someone and someone very important in that. Well, she could have gotten in a lot of trouble, maybe even executed. 
is how seriously they took this stuff. See, social stigma tried to keep her from getting to Jesus. Let me tell you something this morning. We have an enemy who will try his best to convince you that you are not worthy. You are too dirty to get close to Jesus. You fail too much. Your past is too rotten. He knows just what to say. He knows just what to tell you. And let me tell you, let me show you the most common person that he will use to tell you those lies. Because he tells it through a person, don't he? All right, let me tell you the most common person. Well, you'll recognize this in a minute. In your imagination, hold your finger forward and turn it back around. He tells it through you. If she would have listened to the voice inside of her that was screaming at her to stay away from Jesus, she would not have experienced his power. But she did. You see, she had had enough. It was an act of desperation at this point. Twelve years, she had done everything she could, and it just got worse. She was desperate. Y'all, I'm telling you, it's time for us to get desperate for the power of God. Amen. We need to break through the crowd of stuff in our life that's holding us back and get in there and touch it. We got to get close. So how do we do it? All right, we talked about all this. Yeah, we need to, we need to, we need to. There's got to be a recipe. There's got to be something that tells us how to do it. God provided that. All right, how do we do it? I'm glad you asked. Let's look. Let's go back to John chapter 15 for just a few minutes. In John chapter 15, we're going to go down a little bit farther in here. When Jesus talked about us being in the vine, he said we need to abide in the vine. So if we're in the vine and we're close to the vine, we've got the power. I like to read verse 8 first and we'll skip verse 7. We'll get back to it because this explains it. Verse 8 said, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so you be my examples. In other words, he's saying if you do these things that I'm fixing to show you, you will bear much fruit. Do these things and you will be powerful. What things? All right, back up to verse 7. Number one. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Key number one. We need to get our nourishment from the word. Amen. Got to get our nourishment from the word. He said it. And notice what he did there. Jesus puts a direct link here between the amount of our study and the power of our prayers. Did you get that? Did you see it? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. How many times have you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and it feels like you don't get an answer when our prayers are weak? It could be that our study is weak. We're not spending enough time in the Word. If I want my prayers to get the attention of God, then my attention needs to be right here. So key number one is study. Key number two is pray. Let me show you key number three. Look at verses 9 and 10. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He said, keep my commandments. In verse 10, let me translate. Don't sin. Simple as that. Now, I know we can't be perfect with that, can we? We struggle, we can't. I know... That, that, that we can't, we're never going to get it right because we're dragging around this carnal side. But the question is, how hard are we really trying? How much effort are we really putting into that? And I know it feels impossible sometimes because we're weak. And we're weak because we failed at key one and key two. See, we got to take these things in order. We have to fortify our Bible study and our prayer in order to ex exceed and excel in obedience we don't have a chance if we don't we can't fight the fight we can't win it we're not in this and in this Amen. first let me show you key four real quick verse 11 and 12 
He said, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, love other people like he loved us. How is that? Well, he goes on in verse 13. He says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He's, he's alluding ahead to the time that he was going to die on the cross for his friends. We are to love each other sacrificially. Sacrificially. It's an attitude that says, I will willingly give what I have in order to provide what you need. That's the way we love each other. And what a better way to love this lost and dying world that we live in than to tell them of the one who laid down his life for them. Y'all, no, it's as easy as that. It's as easy as that. Bible, pray, obey, love. Bible, pray, obey, love. Say that with me. Bible, pray, obey, love. I don't know about you, but I want to take my life up a notch. I want to keep going forward. I'm tired of feeling weak, y'all. But it's scary. It's scary. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why we don't try harder. It's fear. It's fear. I mean, you see, fear gets fear comes in and tells us if I try, I might fail. If I try to get closer to God, I might fail. You know what? Probably are. Let me try again. If I get closer to God, then He's going to expect more of me. And I might fail at that. You see how that, that cycle of fear keeps growing. You might feel the same. Look, you, you tell me and I'll tell you. Stop being silly. Stop being afraid. Stop listening to the devil <coughs> who wants to feed you that baloney. I want more power. Right. How about you? Can our musicians come up and lead us in a verse of invitation this morning? Look, you know the most important part of this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're not even in the vine. You're not even attached to a husband that doesn't own you yet. All right? You don't have a chance. So if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ your personal Savior, you can't go back to that point in your life where you say, this is where I gave my faith to Jesus Christ. Now is the day of salvation. All right? Maybe you want to come up this morning. Maybe you want to pray for some of that greater power. Maybe you want to pray right there where you're at. Whatever God tells you to do this morning, let's stand together. Let's